Hello and welcome to CMSMC's foundational lecture series. My name is Molly Radford and I serve as one of the CMSMC editors. Today's lecture will focus on materiality and as art historian Petra Langford encourages, what happens when we quote, follow the material. How do we dissect the materials employed? What is the personal significance of the materials to the artist? And how do the cultural associations of the material itself affect the reception of the work of art? <clears throat> we will begin by defining materiality prior to exploring its emergence and evolution in art history. We will subsequently demonstrate the possibilities that arise from studying the histories of materials through an examination of Zoe Leonard's strange fruit. Turning to today's underlying question, what is materiality? The Oxford English Dictionary defines materiality as material which, quote, pertains to a matter as opposed to form, or relates to, quote, matter or body, formed or consisting of matter, corporeal. I would like to draw attention to the opposition used in this definition between matter and form. While form is concerned with structure and shape, Matter is the, quote, substance of which a physical object is composed. Rather than focusing on the purely formal qualities of spatial organization, materiality is concerned with the physical elements allowing for the composition to manifest. Even before, between such closely related terms as matter and material, however, art historian Monica Wagner carefully extricates material from its associates. She notes that in opposition to matter, material, quote, refers only to natural and artificial substances intended for further treatment. Fogner's definition imbues material with a raw anticipatory quality. Paired with form, material submits to this transformation via artistic creation. Through materiality, we may center the characteristics and intrinsic signifiers of the materials themselves beyond their service to composition. In contemporary discourse, it is often observed that this attention to material was long suppressed in the discipline. This may be explained through the philo philosophical origins of the concept of matter, as well as the precedence of visual culture. The first charge may be traced back to Plato's writings on matter versus form and matter versus spirit. In the philosopher's theory of forms, the dual worlds of form and particular are theorized. The world of forms contains a singular abstracted idea, that of a perfect circle, for instance, that transcends our physical experience. The circles that cross the boundary between spheres mime the form of the circle, yet never attain its ideality. Matter exists in the world of particulars. And as material derives from matter, both conceptually and etymologically, so too does it exist here. In aesthetic concerns, therefore, Wagner notes that, quote, material was constantly regarded as the base and counterpart to artistic creativity. <clears throat> While materiality was intrinsic to one's reception of the work of art, formalism relegated the material to a necessary yet unexamined element. First articulated by philosopher Immanuel Kant in the 18th century and elaborated upon by fellow philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel and art historian Heinrich Wolflin, this methodology underscored the study of the form, the internal spatial organization of the work. Kant states in his critique of judgment that, quote, Empirical aesthetic judgments are judgments of sense or material aesthetic judgments. Only pure aesthetic judgments, since they are formal, are properly judgments of taste. Here we note the elevation of composition. The senses, including the physical qualities of the work of art, are subjugated as worldly affairs disassociated from higher notions of the idea. At the turn of the 19th century, Hegel began to engage with the Kantian notion of matter versus spirit. He viewed art as the embodiment of historical development, a 
accomplished through a synthesis of the corporeal and the abstract. Philosopher Lucian Fukowski articulates the Hegelian view of art as, quote, a certain equilibrium between what is symbolized and the symbol's sensuous, sensuous embodiment. In such a position, Hegel gives a greater attention to matter, yet he places matter in opposition to content through this balance, such, such that the sensuous must not hinder the spirit. Once more, the physical is intrinsic to the sensuous embodiment of an abstract idea, but assumes a secondary position to the conceptual pursuits. Similarly positioned as a subordinate in the modern development of iconography led by Abby Barberg and Erwin Panofsky, material concerns were not actively interrogated within the discipline, as these methodologies made, quote, no strong demand on the interpreter to explore medium as a constituent of meaning, as Michael Yonan expresses. This is an interesting observation of an established yet incongruous separation between meaning and material to which I would like to return. But first, let us turn to our second reason for the devaluation of the material. Pictorial illusion occupied a privileged position within visual culture, particularly observed in theories of Renaissance art, the capacity of the medium, especially painting to represent became critical. Observing Antonello Damasina's painting St. Jerome in his study, we are confronted not with the discrete brushstrokes of oil paint on limewood, but with a window into another world. We, the viewers, are transported to the outside of this study and peer into his private moment of reflection. As we experience the physically impossible recession of this space, the picture plane dissolves in place of the imagined architecture. Art critic Clement Greenberg refers to the attainment of this illusion as a, quote, overpowering of the medium. In this encounter, we are seemingly absorbed into the subject as the materials that allow for this composition dematerialize. How and why should we be concerned with the material when it has evaporated to behold this other world? Or, or when it has been transformed into flesh? This elevation of the representational capacity of art can only be preserved, however, as long as the dissolution of its physical properties persists. This transfiguration ceased with the inception of modern art. No longer did material quietly serve the singular purpose of a vehicle through which the subject was realized. Instead, modern art exposed the material means of creation and thus the objecthood of the work of art. Greenberg cites French painter Gustave Courbet as one of the first to foreground the corporeality of the work. He accomplished this stylistically through what Greenberg refers to as a quote, new flatness. There is a manipulation of the brushstroke, the paint, that makes not only the artist's hand more apparent, but also the intention of the painting as representation. Without the disillusion of the canvas, the viewer becomes conscious of the art's act of representing. Borrowing the aforementioned Kantian opposition, Greenberg describes this stylistic shift as a flight from, quote, matter to spirit. Here we observe the surpassing of the ideal by the sensuous. It is made more explicit, however, with the emergence of Cubism in the early 20th century. Pioneered by Pablo Picasso and George Brock, the movement traded linear perspective for a fragmented plane upon which the artist generally depicted everyday objects, cafe tables, instruments, and anonymous figures. As we see in Brock's violin and candlestick of 1910, the style produced overlapping incongruous perspectives in a disorienting subversion of pictorial illusion. The angularity of forms echoes the scaffolding of the artwork its support of stretched canvas upon wood frame. Text was also introduced, not as one might have seen in books or letters depicted in the past, but isolated, seemingly random letters stenciled onto the surface of the picture plane. Here in Picasso's Still Life with Chair Caning of 1912, the letters J-O-U are painted. With a wink, he alludes to both play and day in French, the second perhaps in reference to the daily newspaper 
folded upon the table. This inclusion both underscores the flatness of the artwork and the artist's action in its production. For the letters trigger acknowledgement of their phys artist's physical encounter with the flat surface of the canvas. Furthermore, Picasso has incorporated various media, the titular chair caning, as well as rope to frame the canvas. Rather than the illusory depiction of these elements in past art, the physical reality of these components is foregrounded. We encounter the objects as such. In this way, Picasso encroaches upon our reality. We engage through it with our senses, through its haptic qualities, in an elevation of the material over the symbolized. Greenberg traces this developing flatness and quote, death of the three-dimensional pictorial space in his theorizing of medium specificity. He posits that each medium has a singular intrinsic characteristic and that art which abides by these qualities attains a greater status. As he states, quote, the unique and proper area of competence of each art coincides with all that is unique in the nature of the medium. As in painting, flatness is exclusive, he views modernism as the paradigm of medium specificity. This would seem to indicate a deference to the material, yet the reduction of the medium to its intrinsic forms is merely a means of achieving abstraction for Greenberg. He is not interested in what the materials do or say, but how they may transcend reality towards the ideal form of the medium. As art historian Hope Mogerol observes, quote, materiality or matter here is recognized, but then canceled out. Thus, we seem to have returned to Kantian thought, dividing matter from form. Though accomplished through a modern reflection on medium, this nonetheless neglects the cultural and historical implications of the materials themselves. Thus far, we have focused primarily on how we do not give deference to materials. But what happens when we do? With the birth of modernism, we are confronted with the realities of the physical composition. The borrowing of everyday materials in Dada, Fluxism, and other 20th century movements made an understanding of these objects even more critical. So how do we pose questions not on what is represented, but how a work is physically composed? And beyond that, how do our preconceived notions of the materials used affect our encounter with the work of art? Let us approach materials through the personal, cultural, and political traces that remain. These lenses and their intersections may shed light onto not only the choices of the artist in isolation, but the complex network of social, economic, and political implications with which the artist engages through these materials. Prior to exploring these perspectives, however, we must first turn to the experiential, to our individual sensorial responses as we encounter the work of art. How do we react to works such as Joseph Boyce's Fat Chair or Robert Morris's Lead and Felt? How do we attempt to relate these recognizable materials placed in incongruous environments? Let us break down our relationship to not only form, but also the materials through these works of Boyce and Morris. To me, there is an immediate haptic recollection when viewing the heap of yellow fat upon the white wooden chair in Boyce's work. The smooth, greasy texture that would linger on one's hand if one was to touch, the deference of the fat to other objects, whether a chair in this instance or perhaps a butter knife, our recognition exposes the fragility of the material through its malleability, for it could melt and slip away a puddle after the artist's creation. In lead and felt, I am bombarded by the innumerable clashes between the titular materials, between brightness and darkness, malleability and rigidity, coldness and warmth, lightness and weight, reflectivity and absorption. As the minimalist forms round our immediate encounter with the materials themselves, questions of representation are replaced by those of sense. The recognition of our involuntary reactions to the work of art is important, 
for they not only aid us in situating the work within our own realities, but also connects us to the artist's experience in its making. Morris's essay, Anti-Form, from 1968, sheds light onto his hyper-awareness of the material in his practice. He writes, a direct investigation of the properties of these materials is in progress. In some cases, these investigations move from the making of things to the making of material itself. Sometimes a direct manipulation of a given material without the use of any tool is made. In these cases, considerations of gravity become as important as those of space. The focus on matter and gravity as means results in forms which were not projected in advance. The spontaneity of creation and attention to the inherent properties outlined by Morris reveal themselves in lead and felt. The installation appears as a distillation of these materials to pure form without purpose. The simple accumulation of materials and their responses to underpinning physical principles. Morris uses the evacuated space of representation to question the meta operations that underlie art itself. This bring, brings us to the broader question of how the artist treats the material. British sculptor Henry Moore encouraged a quote, truth to materials, permitting the organic characteristics to be honored through form. Yet here we have works where the form resists the material or vice versa. <clears throat> that is an organic matter spanning the states of liquid and solid. While Boyce uses the material in its latter form, its inherent properties weaken it against its own environment as well as time. Boyce indeed recognizes this delicacy in the state of matter and harnesses it as a representation of the material and spiritual transcendence in his private lexicon of material meanings. In this instance, we thus observe matter pushing against, against its intended form in allusion to its capacity for transformation. For Morris, however, form defies matter, or rather the functionality of matter. As previously mentioned, he distills the composition to pure form in a display of the contrasting physical properties of lead and felt. Morris pulls these two elements away from their industrial purposes, denying their functional capacities through form as he arranges rather than transforms these elements. Thus, we observe a triangulation in the treatment of materials. First, a symbiotic relationship between matter and form. Secondly, the supremacy of composition over matter. And lastly, the negation of functionality through form. Through an artist's own statements and the characteristics of the selected media, we might better determine where the work falls across these varied relationships. By considering how artists not only employ materials, but subvert their inherent properties or capabilities, we may perceive the tensions within the composition, as well as their broader social purposes, fulfilled or unfulfilled. These first steps of contemplating our impulsive reactions to the art and the relationships between matter and form lay the foundation for studying the work through its materiality. As art historian James Elkins observes, some of the most fruitful contemporary art historical discourse comes from writers who are, quote, attentive to what their bodies tell them about the artwork. The question is, after this sensorial evaluation, how do we step beyond the immediacy of the artwork and into the network of material meanings? Here, I would like to return to Langbert's suggestion to quote, follow the material. Today, we follow the material through the aforementioned lenses of the biographical, the cultural, and the political. I have selected these three views as a means of breaking down the histories of the materials. German philosopher Theodore Adorno writes, for the forms, even the materials are by no means merely given by nature. 
as an unreflective artist might easily presume. History has accumulated in them and spirit permeates them. Here we have the notion of the spirit, yet rather than being in opposition to matter, it imbues it with a transcendence, transcendent essence. Materials enter the composition with unique and ever-changing connotations. This might be through their evolving societal reception, particularly true of novel matter, or in shifting political implications, such as questions of economics and labor. When the material is used in the work of art, these associations persist and thus influence the reception and understanding of the work of art. Rather than separating issues of form from those of the physical, we may greatly benefit from an interrogation of how these underlying meanings support or confront representational intentions. Let us first turn to the biographical. Through this personal history, we situate the material within the artist's life and oeuvre. We inscribe our understanding of what the material means in an intimate circle of artist and artwork. These manipulated, mani manipulated materials serve as physical traces of their creator's life, with what German philosopher Walter Benjamin identifies as, quote, the aura of the work of art. Beyond a reflection of the immediate personal interventions of the artist, materials engage with a broader sign system unique to their creator. For boys, the use of fat affirms this self-mythologizing. After his plane crashed in Crimea in 1944, he alleged that he was rescued by Tartar tribesmen who wrapped his injuries in fat and felt. The two materials subsequently emerged across his work as a foregrounding of not only his apocryphal or origins, but also his greater interests in shamanism and the healing capacities of various matter. While felt too in this instance is tightly bound to the artist's myth, Morris's employment of the same substance focuses on the structures underpinning the work of art by selecting and composing a material seemingly without inherent meaning. We might therefore ask, in opposition to the material expression of biography, in what ways may the personal be suppressed by matter? This question is particularly pertinent to the aforementioned co-opting of the ready-made, supplanting the hand of the artist for the uniformity and multiplicity of the machine. This action denies the aura of the work of art. The mechanical reproducibility disrupts the material's status as a trace of the artist's life. Instead, as the artist arranges the work, we may question the extent to which a biographical reading is pertinent. <clears throat> Though written in a literary context, French theorist Roland Barthes argues for the quote, death of the author, a severance between work and biography towards the liberation of the text. Might an interrogation of the ready-made without concern for authorship be beneficial? While generative discussions may be had on both sides of this debate, we may see that through biographical or intentionally anti-biographical readings of the material, we may better understand the influence of matter upon our reception of the work. Next, we turn to the cultural. The histories of the material accumulate uniquely across regions and periods. It is therefore critical to understand the social implications of matter beyond the scope of both artist and art history at large. As Michael Ann Hawley recognizes, anthropologists have assisted art historians in defining material culture, where they have articulated the relationships between man and matter beyond the bounds of this field. <clears throat> we may employ this notion of engaging with non-art historical concerns to determine issues of material production, consumption, proliferation, and purpose. Does the material come from nature, or when was it first invented? In what ways is the material used, such as the commonality of felt against the lab industrial labor-specific uses of lead? Does it have any ritualistic purposes? 
Has its function or perception changed? Is it used differently across regions and cultures? We may all ingest fat as a nutritional substance, yet the Tartars employed it for its apparent healing properties, a view that Boyes later relied on in his work. As we see, there are innumerable questions that we may pose. What is critical is that we raise them to advance to a more precise understanding of how the material has been employed outside of the gallery and how that might affect its reception within. For inspiration on how to proceed with these historical interrogations, let us look to French philosopher Georges D.D. Huberman's diligent study of a single material, wax, in his essay, The Order of Material, Plasticities, Malays, and Survivals of 1999, tracing its first significant mention to Plato and proceeding in its various perceptions and functions across centuries, arriving at one of the last wax workers in Sicily, Didi Huberman carefully articulates its evolving social signification from a quote, material fantasy in its infinite plasticity to the modern gaudiness of the wax museum. We may perform this historical exposition of all matter to further our understanding such an analysis allows us to ground the material and thus the art in contemporaneous social meanings that may elevate or confront the formal intentions of art. Lastly, we examine the political implications of the material. As Langburn declares, it is a quote, political decision to focus on the materials of art. It means to consider the processes of making and their associated power relations. She further elaborates that this includes determining where the material is produced, whether factory, studio, or other space, and if the laborer remains anonymous. Particularly pertinent post-industrialization with the rise of mass production and consumption, we articulate the material's history through the concerns of who is making and who is using these substances and ready-made objects. In doing so, we may reframe the cultural questions previously posed as issues of socioeconomic status and labor. Karl Marx identifies the industrialization of the 19th century as a critical axis upon which materials turned from a fixed use value to a raw state with a transcendent conceptuality signifying the social relations of man. The expansion of production and invention advanced society towards a fetishization of the commodity in what art historian Dietmar Rubel describes as the quote, fallout of de our desire for modernity. In this new order of the synthetic, we may locate the power relations of society through the material a physical manifestation of that connection between laborer and consumer, each material imbues the work of art with a complex socioeconomic signification ripe for evaluation. Having delineated these three perspectives generally, let us now turn to a work that encapsulates these histories, Zoe Leonard's Strange Fruit. Produced between 1992 and 1997, the work consists of hundreds of pieces of fruit, more specifically their peels, stitched together and adorned with various buttons, fabrics, and wires. Encountered in the space, these diminutive bodies have a familiar form, yet are disassociated from immediate recognition in their manipulation by the artist and natural degradation over time. When we realize what we are viewing, the crescent shape of the banana, or the once spherical orange, concerns of time and of death become foregrounded. We stand in the space of decaying organic matter with such deterioration marking our own passage through time. This process of consumption, collection, and repair was undertaken following the loss of her friend David Voynarovich to AIDS in 1992. A meditation not only on private grief but also a greater societal crisis. The work mirrors historical violence and death through its title, borrowed from the anti-lynching song by Abel Mirapol. 
Through title alone, the sense of mourning haunts the installation. Yet the material furthers Leonard's personal and our collective grief as we are overwhelmed by this vision of decay. First, studying the installation through a personal material history, we examine Leonard's painstaking process of collection and repair. Each of the hundreds of bananas, avocados, grapefruits, and oranges were consumed by either Leonard or her acquaintances and amassed by the artist for drying and suturing. Every peel thus takes on a most intimate meaning as a leftover of her nourishment and a physical signifier of her network of friends collectively mourning their loss. While the work most directly represents Boynarovich's passing and all lost age, AIDS, the fruit collected also underscores the days and years lived by Leonard beyond his death. This splits the personal history of the fruit as an embodiment of Leonard's own time past and sustained by its nutrition and the decay of the discards mirroring her loss. Despite the persistence of decay, Leonard attempts a sort of reparation through the suturing of these peels. The contrast of these adornments, yarn, buttons, and wires against the blackening rinds suggests a wrestling of the artist to recover life or at least the memories of those lost. In this synthetic intervention upon the organic, we witness Leonard's process of mourning. The materials of strange fruit thus embody an intimate portrait of loss. Yet we have also mentioned its wider implications as an expression of cultural grief. This occurs through both the multiplicity and singularity of the materials. Leonard has selected the general category of fruit as a representation of the individuals lost. One banana is interchangeable with any other as we select them from grocery stores and farmers markets. The sea of fruit that we encounter is emblematic of an unlimited commodity, suggesting an even greater population. The choice of organic material, however, sets each piece on a unique path of deterioration compounded by the individuation of Leonard's repairs. While each is unique, this decay is collectively inevitable. She intentionally elected to not apply preservation techniques to the work, for it to, quote, decompose in its own time. We consequently perceive through this matter the simultaneous magnitude of loss and singular experience of each affected life. Through such a meditation on this large scale crisis, Leonard naturally engages with the political. An outspoken AIDS activist, she quote, grapples with big questions using remarkably meager means, as art critic Rachel Turner describes. Here, Leonard takes the most seemingly mundane matter to physically reenact loss and confront the viewer with the emergency occurring beyond the white cube. While Strange Fruit takes on a socio-political position in subject matter, her use of the organic also echoes surrealist George Bataille's concept of face material, indicative of ruins and decay. Langburn describes this mode of material as, quote, antithetical to the smooth surfaces of capitalist consumer goods, and which corresponds to our own mortality. Though capitalist notions creep into the work through the persistence of the synthetic Chiquita sticker and other adornments against the blackening peel, Leonard's similar turn against mass production and the fetishization of novel synthetic goods grounds the work in the natural order of the world, a cycle of life and death proceeding relentlessly through time. Today, we have explored the historical development of materiality, as well as how we might now evaluate the work of art through its matter. Looking to the future, we may expand this study to questions of the immaterial through the pro proliferation of digital technologies, as well as how we might benefit from the advancements in the science of materials. As an individual focusing on modern and contemporary European and American art, I have outlined artists from these regions and periods today 
as examples of how materials themselves may enhance our interpretations and reception of art. However, I also encourage raising these questions across the entire discipline of art history. As materials are employed, circulated, and invented across the globe, they accumulate meanings. By peeling back these layers, we may greatly benefit from new revelations. For as Tim Ingold states, to understand materials is to be able to tell their histories. Thank you for joining me today in this study of materiality.